All right. So we're here on another Wednesday night. And we, the last five Wednesday nights, we have been studying deception. And we were going to continue on with deception. Uh, who is God? But that changed this week. And we're going to move on to something else and we'll come back to that. Okay. All right. So I want to share a couple things before we get started. First of all, this is not an advertisement for Lowry's. But I was in, I go in there all the time because I like old books. They are a treasure trove of Aren't old they? books. Oh, they're great. This right here is Charles Spurgeon, 18, 1887. This is an original the seventh volume of The Treasury of David. You hear the pastor talking about it all the time. Uh-huh. Ten bucks. Oh, wow. Ten bucks for this book. And if you want to talk about it, all seven... Uh, all seven volumes, I was reading the history on it, it took him 20 years to write these books. Wow. 20 years. But, I mean, I've read the first couple pages, and you're not going to get any better writing than that. So, it's not advertising for Lowry's, for <laughs> but they have a whole religious the- theological yeah. section that you can find stuff like this, and this is this is the good stuff. And most of the religious or Christian books are cheaper than anything else. I mean, he, <laughs> you know, when I, my wife found the book, and, because I was going to get a uh, history, a book on the uh, history of the American Civil War. And it was like this really thick book, and I handed it to him, and he said, it's going to be 25 bucks. I was like, wow. <laughs> then she hands me this book and says, look at this. And I said, wow. And I saw the, the Spurgeon book. And I gave it to him, and he goes, wow, this is a rare book. And he says, it's probably going to be up there. And he goes, 10 bucks. I said, and the money. <laughs> so very good, uh, very good find there. Um, I wrote up here Pilgrim Song. If you want to write that down, you can. Uh, everything that I that I write up here is a book. I get it off the internet, but I get it off of archive.org, which is a place with books. And you can find these books, you know, in the libraries or whatever, you know, if you find the right one. But I found these books as two volumes called Pilgrim Songs. And it's written by this guy, M. W. Herzberger, in the 1880s. And I want to read this song out of this book uh, because it goes along with our study. Right? right. The song is called The Wooing of the Pilgrim. Now we know that we're pilgrims in this world, right? So The Wooing of the Pilgrim. O oh, Jesus, dearest Jesus, how shall my, my joyous soul praise it however sweetly thy wondrous love extol? Thy love that placed the sinner as thy most treasured bride in royal robes and honor at thy exalted side. O oh, what was there within me to please thine holy eye? What shining garment clothed me to draw thee loving nigh? What beauty, grace, or riches could I account my own, that thou couldst find such pleasure to take my heart thy throne, to make my heart thy throne. All naked I was dying in sin and greatest shame, with filthy rags for raiment, unrighteousness for name. Cast out as unclean offal, a wretched soul I lay in blood and wounds and sorrow, foul hell's desired prey. But thou, but though the earth and heaven loathe my vile company, Yet thou, the Lord of glory, could not contented thee to leave me in my anguish, to know in death my part, but long to take the sinner to thy love-burning heart. From thy great throne of glory and uncreated light, thou came into my bondage and grieving sorrow's night. Thou camest poor and lowly to make me rich and great and took in loving kindness on thee my dreadful fate. To win me robes of honor, you wore robes of shame. That I might live in glory, you suffered great defame. And that the crown immortal, which all the blessed adorns, my guilty head might circle, thou wore a crown of thorns. Thou tookest on thy shoulders the burden of my guilt, and on thy stainless raiment, thy precious blood was spilt. The winepress of God's anger, alone by thee was trod, 
that thou might save forever me from his angry, angry rod. But though thy tears and prayers, thy suffering, death, and grave, redeemed him who his lifetime was Satan's trembling slave, and though thou stretcheth daily thy saving arms to me, yet I in nameless folly thy loving heart could flee. The ways of sin and sorrow were dearer to my feet than all thy ways of mercy and grace and peace so sweet. All rather would I listen unto the tempter's voice than take thy invitation and in thy love rejoice. O oh, truly I have doubt, doubtly deserved my dreadful fate. Thou wert thou were just in closing on me thy mercy's gate. Thou wert just in leaving me to my dreadful lot. In passing could just judgment go hence, I know thee not. But thou, but though my heart rejected the offerings of thy peace, yet thou wouldest not reject me, yet thou wouldest never cease to follow ever loving and wooing at my side, until at last thou want me and made me thy bride. O love beyond extolling, beyond all depth and height, O love the song of angels, save sinners great delight. If in the highest heavens my raptured heart were strung, singing through endless ages, thy praise were left unsung. Wow. Man. Beautiful. They wrote different back in the day, didn't they? Beautiful, beautiful writing. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And how, how that ties in with what we're going to be talking about in the next probably couple weeks, um, definitely the next couple weeks, is how the Lord Jesus is our high priest, all right? And that whole song is talking about that, and it's talking about his, uh, the atonement and what he did for us, and that he became poor to make us rich. Um, we're going to get into the study of the high priest, an introduction, and it's going to be a little more in-depth, and it may be a lot of things that you guys already know, but... There's going to be some things that you haven't seen before, and it's incumbent upon us to see these things so we can better understand who the Lord Jesus is. Why is it important that he is my high priest if, if the high priest was designated to the children of Israel? You see, as a Gentile, how is it that it's important to me to know how he's my high priest? So we're going to cover a lot of the book of Hebrews, um, the book of Hebrews, a little bit of history. They... Some people believe it was written by Paul. Some people don't. Different style of writing. But um, I don't think it was written by Paul, personally. It is a different style of writing. And it is really focused on, really focused on the temple and the priest. Uh, there was a lot of knowledge that the, that the writer of the book of Hebrews had on the, the priest and the vestments and the, the, the wear and all the things in the tabernacle. And what they meant and how they translated is to that us. that breastplate that he has on the 12 tribes? That is, and we'll get, we're going to get to that. That's going to be a study on itself. It'll be leading up to that. But this is right here, the high priest. And this is actually him at the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, standing before the mercy seat, sprinkling, sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat in the presence of God where the cherubim are. That's a, it's a drawing, but it gives you an idea of, of what, it, what it was like. Now, when we get to the vestments or the clothing, we're going to see that this picture isn't entirely accurate. I just wanted to bring it forward to you so you can see it. But we'll see that that's not entirely accurate, but uh, as far as full clothing goes, that's what you look. So let's get started. The word priest is used 751 times in the Bible. 751 times. The Hebrew word for priest is Kohen. Now that word Kohen is very interesting because this is what it means. It means one who stands or another, or as a mediator, or mediates his cause. It 
In the Old Testament, the word priest, Kohen, means one who stands for another and mediates his cause. Now, what's interesting about this is if you know anything about the Jewish culture, you know anything about the Jews, the Jews don't believe that the Lord Jesus is the Messiah, right. right? They don't believe that. But if we read in Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, the one who came to bore our iniquity, right? Acquainted with grief. The Jews don't believe that a suffering servant that would stand for another and mediate on the cause for others they don't believe that. They believe he'll be a political leader who puts Israel back on the map as the world, world leader. But what's interesting is even in their own writings, the Kohen, this is exactly what it stands for. But they don't look at Jesus as doing that. Wow. It's, a con it's contradictory. Yeah. You see, because that's exactly what he came to do. Mm -hmm. And he came to them to do it. And they rejected it. That's very interesting. Because they read this every day. The, the rabbis are reading this every single day. And they're reading it and reading it. And the Bible, you, we know it's true. Because in Acts 28, Paul says, that's it. God's done with you. You are blinded. You are divinely blinded. And we can see it today that they are divinely blinded. Yeah. Did you have something? Um, when witnessing to a Jew, that's exactly the uh, chapter, uh, chapter to give them. What's that? Acts 28? No, 53. Oh, yeah. Exactly what you're witnessing to a Jew. Well, you're going to see some things here as well that will help you if, if you do run into any Jewish people and y'all start talking about the Bible, you can bring up some of these things and uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation. <laughs> Did you have something? Okay. So, Kohen. The Greek word Perus it means one who offers sacrifices. One who offers sacrifices. Now, Jews do not read the Christian Bible, the Greek New Testament. They don't read it. This is one reason they don't get how everything ties in together. Because the New Testament explains the Old Testament. So they, obviously, they're not getting that information. They do have a concept of it. They reject it. All right? But a priest. So in the Hebrew, we got Kohen. In the Greek, Herus. And they're both, meant to, they're both meant to stand for somebody else and mediate for one and to offer sacrifices. All right? Now we're talking about the Jewish concept. Now, turn to Numbers 3 right quick. We're going to do a lot of flipping here because... Uh, in the Word of God, because there's a lot that you're going to see. Isaiah three, uh, Numbers three. Oh, Numbers. Oh my God. Numbers chapter three. Chapter three. So let's read one through three right quick. These also are the generations of Aaron and Moses in the day that the Lord spoke with Moses in Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the priests which were anointed, whom he consecrated to minister the priest's office. All right. All through scripture, you'll see the anointed priest. The anointed. The priest is known as the anointed. Alright? And that's gonna that's gonna play in later. Now, what I wrote up here, pagan priests in the Bible, a side note, that's a side note, that we're not gonna cover the pagan priests in the Bible because there are. You'll see uh, a lot of times where, like for instance, we talked about uh Potiphar, who was Joseph's father-in-law. He was the priest of On in Egypt. He was not a priest of God, all right? And some of these 751, the 751 times that the word priest is used, it's used for a pagan priest, 
All right? So we're not going to cover them. Just let me know that. We're going to cover the anointed priests, okay? Mm -hmm. The ones who God anointed. So who can tell me the first time that the word priest is used and who is the priest in the Bible? Who is the, who is the priest first mentioned in the Bible? Yes. Is it Melchizedek? Melchizedek. And here's the verse you can find out. Genesis 14. <clears throat> now who knows we're doing a little Bible knowledge here who knows how many times Melchizedek is mentioned in the Old Testament right <laughs> answer is two that's it two times when I first read that Melchizedek I'll be honest with you I thought he was the Christ that they were talking about when I, and, and tell you reread it, and, you know. Yep. And, and I thought, well, yep. Smoked. Right. So hey, we're, we're going to see that in a minute. So Melchizedek, we're going to see here in a minute, is mentioned only twice in the Old Testament. It's mentioned once in Genesis 14, and then it's mentioned once in Psalms 110:4, where David is prophesying, saying that there's going to be one who's going to be a priest of God, who's of the order of Melchizedek. All right. Now, the only way you really get to know who Melchizedek is is to go to the book of Hebrews. So let's go. To, let's go to Hebrews. Melchizedek is only mentioned as the king of Salem. What? Where is Salem? What town is Salem? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. All right. Before it was Jerusalem, it was Salem. He's mentioned as the king of Salem coming out to greet Abraham after, after Abraham gets back from battle going to fetch Lot who got kidnapped. All right. So he brings them back. They have all the spoils. They come back. And the king of Salem, Melchizedek, comes out. And Abraham ends up tithing 10% of everything that he has to Melchizedek. Very interesting, right? And in the, in the word, in, in Hebrews, it talks about that the less blessed the greater, meaning Abraham actually blessed Melchizedek, right? So let's see who Melchizedek is right quick. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. I'm sorry. Chapter 7. Now, we're not going to stay on Melchizedek, but he's interesting to our study. So verse 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, prince of the most, I mean, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, Melchizedek is king of righteousness, that's, his, that's what his name means. And after that, he's the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Who's the prince of peace? Jesus. Right. The Lord Jesus, right? Yeah. And who's the king of righteousness? Jesus. The Lord Jesus, right? <laughs> but, so let's continue on. Without father and without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. Now, we get, you get into all these conversations, you'll hear a lot of commentary, you'll hear a lot of conversation about Melchizedek was the Lord Jesus, a, a personification of him back in the day. Well, I personally don't believe that because it says he was made like unto, right? He wasn't, it wasn't him, but it was, a, it was one that was a picture of him, Amen. all right? So, there are Christ, uh, Christophanies, <coughs> who knows what a Christophany is? But Christophany is an appearance of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament, like the angel of the Lord. A lot of people think that's, that's Christ uh, before he was incarnate as a human being. All right? But Melchizedek is not. But he's very interesting because in... Um, did, Abraham, did Abraham think that Melchizedek was the Lord? Because, I mean, I read that next thing down below that. And I think he said he was yeah. Yep. So obviously Abraham saw this man as 
more, what we were talking about, Abraham sees him as more righteous than himself. Yes. You see? So he gives him the, a tenth percent. Um, and so when we read right here in verse 7, it says, And without all contradiction, the less is blessed by the better. Yeah. You see? Melchizedek actually blesses Abraham. And because of that, Abraham gives him a tenth percent of everything. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the way it is with God. Yeah. Right? When they were tithing, God would bless them. They would give 10%. God would bless them. They would give, you see, it's kind of that same thing. So, uh, look at verse, look at chapter 6, verse 20. Verse 6, I mean, chapter 6, verse 20. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever out of, after the order of Melchizedek. All right? So what we're going to learn is that the Lord Jesus, and we're not going to get into it a whole lot right now, but what we're going to learn is that the Lord Jesus, in Psalms 110, David prophesies, saying that God's anointed is going to be made a priest after the order of the Melchizedek. That is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus coming. Mm -hmm. And this states it right here as well. Chapter 6, verse 20. That it was Jesus who was made the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Confirming right there in Hebrews. So, this prophecy, if we read in Hebrews 7.21. Let's turn there right quick. 7.21. Now, now, if we continue to read here, and actually we should, let's do that. Start at verse 11, and we'll read to 21. Because we're going to be talking about the Levitical priesthood, okay, in a minute. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. It was under Aaron and his sons, the Levitical priesthood, that we received right. the law. The Ten Commandments, right? What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? You see, why is it that there was another priest called after Melchizedek and not after Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made a necessity of the changing also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. What that's saying is, is that the Lord Jesus didn't come from the tribe of Levi. He was not a Levite. Right. What, what tribe did he come from? Judah. Judah. He's of the tribe of Judah, which is the kingly line, right? So he's saying, um, he of whom these things per are pertaining to, which is the Lord Jesus, is from another tribe. And no man back, back in the Levitical priesthood gave attendance at the altar because he, they weren't, he wasn't a Levite. He was a, a Judah did not go to the altar. It was only Levi. For it is evident that our Lord Jesus sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. He didn't say nothing about Judah being a priest, his family. And it is yet far more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arise, arises another priest who is made not after the law of carnal commandments, but after the power of an endless life. For he testified, this is talking about David, in Psalm 110.4, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's God saying that. You see, he's telling the Lord Jesus, telling the Son of God, you are going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannoying or an undoing of the commandment going before the weaknesses and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, which is the Lord Jesus, by the which we draw near unto God. We only draw near unto God by the Lord Jesus. You should see it. It all points to him. Verse 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever out of the, after the order of Melchizedek. Let me explain that. Psalms 110 is a prophecy, but it's also an oath by God informing 
everybody, informing, it's a prophecy, saying that there's going to be one who's anointed that's going to be after the order of Melchizedek, and that was an oath. All these other priests, the Levitical priests, the sons of Aaron, were not appointed by oath. They were appointed by hereditary man, means. It was son after son after son after son, right? They didn't have to swear in or anything. God says, I swear. I am swearing that I am bringing a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which is the Lord Jesus. All right. We're going we're gonna to come back to him because he's, he's important, but we're going to move on. Now, the second mention of a priest is in Exodus. Let's turn to Exodus. So we have Genesis 14, and then we have Exodus 2. This is when Moses is fleeing from Pharaoh. He flees from Pharaoh and he goes to the land of Midian, which is on the other side of the Red Sea. If you look, the Red Sea is like this. Here is Sinai in the middle. On the other side of here is Midian in Saudi Arabia. All right? We have Jethro. Who's Jethro? His father-in-law. His father-in-law, right? Uh, so let's read verse 15. 2 verse 15. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian, there's a priest, had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs of water, their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how is it that you are come so soon today? And then they say an Egyptian delivered us and all these things. But he's called a priest right there. All right. But if we go to verse, if we go to chapter three, verse 17, I'm sorry, chapter three, verse one. So we see Ruel has seven daughters that go to the well and Moses defends them and they come back and tell their dad. Uh, chapter three, verse one says, now Moses kept the flock in Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. All right. So Jethro. And Ruel, in commentary in the McClinic and Strong Encyclopedia, say that they're the same person. All right? They're the same person. Jethro and Ruel. Uh, there's a lot of different views on it, but that's what they say. I mean, we could go really deep into that, but we're not going to do that. There are instances where a person in the Old Testament has two names. Is there not? Give me an example. Daniel. Daniel and Belteshazzar, right? What about not in Babylon, but in Israel? Give me an example. The person has two names. Yeah. Solomon. Solomon and Jedediah. Jedediah, there's well. <laughs> or Israel. Who said that? You said that? Israel and who? What's Israel's name? Jacob. Jacob. All right. So there was a lot of instances where they had two names. This is one of them. Jethro was called a priest of Midian. And if you go through, it talks about him a little bit. So there's two instances right there before the Levitical priesthood that priests are mentioned. You see? And there's one more. Go to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Verse 20. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Verse 22. And let the priests also, which come near to you, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth. On them. So it talks about priests in Israel, right? Before Aaron is even mentioned. You see that? How is that? How is that so? Here's the answer. 
There's two different priesthoods, which we just saw in Hebrews. There's a heavenly priesthood, and there's a Levitical priesthood. Both are anointed by God, but there's a difference. The Levitical priesthood was the priesthood that introduced the law. God introduced the law into this priesthood, and it was meant for a certain purpose, for a certain thing. Obviously, Melchizedek does not belong to the, the Levitical priesthood. He's way outside that. He's way above that, right? The Lord Jesus obviously doesn't belong to the Levitical, Levitical priesthood. He's of the tribe of Judah, not of Levi. You see that? So there is a heavenly priesthood. There's a spiritual priesthood. Yes. Okay, so um, this Melchizedek is always... Um, I don't understand that. So you're saying, if I get this corrected, that Melchizedek was from the heavenly priesthood? Yes. He is a... He is of the spiritual priesthood, the higher priesthood of God. And it's interesting when you study Melchizedek and you study the Lord Jesus, you have to study Hebrews. You have to study that book to understand what is going on. God has, and it was made, the Lord Jesus was made um, a priest of the order of Melchizedek. But Melchizedek himself was made after the similitude of the Lord Jesus. Back then. The son is eternal. Is he not? The tabernacle. When we look at the tabernacle. Is it not a shadow of the heavenly things? Is it not? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is a physical thing that was on earth. Yeah. Right? God said you're going to make it like this and like this and like this. And here's going to be all the things. But what does it do? It is a picture and a shadow of the things that are in heaven. Yeah. Same thing with this. Same thing with the Levitical priesthood. But. So you actually had. The true priesthood, the spiritual priesthood on the earth before God brought down the Levitical priesthood and appointed it to Aaron's sons. So how did Melchizedek get here on earth? Good that, question. I, I don't understand that. Good question. It says he's without father, without mother, no descent. It, no end of days. So he's just mentioned in the Bible as, as the order of Melchizedek? He's mentioned as a man. He's, a, he's an actual man that Abraham spoke with that Abraham tied it to he was the king of Salem he was the king of Jerusalem back before it was Jerusalem but it's a mystery it's a mystery okay. because he was put here by God but he has no descent he has no family he has no mother no father none of that I can't explain it but you know okay. well, right? you can't explain I can't explain it <laughs> <laughs> he's from he's whatever he is whoever he is he's, he is from God. That's why put I, on this earth. I thought that because we know that when Christ was, you know, uh, conceived through Mary, yep. and that gives us a start, but we don't even have a start with Melchizedek. that. No, you don't. You don't. Yes. Um, I think it, it's really uh, Melchizedek. Uh, his existence proves that the heavenly priesthood is like without beginning and without end. Yes. And uh, existed like well before. The uh, covenant with Abraham. Yes. And uh, there seems to be, I hear a lot of like mistaken ideas that like God came like only to be God of the Jews and you know the God of Abraham and that was his chosen people and the only people that he was interested in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the order of Melchizedek really disproves that. I'd say absolutely like, because he was not a Jew. Mm -hmm. He's not Israel. He's I guess you would consider him a Gentile. You know, he was not, uh, uh, he was not a Jew. So it's a very interesting study. You know, we can go really, really deep into this, the Levitical and spiritual priesthood. But we, after the priest of the order of Melchizedek has come, the Lord Jesus has come, and he's died, and now he's got the, got the keys of death and hell, and he's sitting on the right hand of majesty. Now, what are we? We are priests, right? The spiritual priests. We are a new creation. These kind of things. So eventually, we're going to understand Melchizedek. <laughs> we don't understand it now because we're flesh and we're, we we have sin. Sure. You see, but when it's all said and done, we will we will understand that priesthood because it will be fulfilled in us, kings and priests. He has made us kings and priests in Revelation. So let's continue.
we could go a long way on Melchizedek and question and, and ponder and but <laughs> so so there's obviously no doubt a priesthood before the Levitical priesthood. There is a priesthood, an eternal priesthood, spiritual. And, and Melchizedek is a representative of that. Now the beginning of the Levitical priesthood obviously starts with who? Right? It's, it will be the sons of Levi who are the priests. But there will be a specific line. And we talked about this in the Bible study. If you were here, the specific line that runs through Amram and Aaron. So let's turn to 1 Chronicles 6. Six one. These are the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Verse twenty two. The sons of Kohath. The sons of Kohath are Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. You see Amram right there. The son of Kohath is Amram. Now turn to Chronicles 23. Verse 12. The sons of Kohath are Amram, Ishar, Hebron, Uziel. 13. The sons of Amram, which is one of the sons of Kohath, is Aaron and Moses. And Aaron was separated that he should sanctify the most holy things, he and his sons forever, to burn incense before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name forever. You see that? Kohath's son was Amram. And his sons were Aaron and Moses. Levi, Kohath, Amram, Aaron. And then we have the sons of Aaron. Nadab, Abihu were killed by strange fire. Remember? The two that are left, Ithamar and Eliezer. And we get, got into a little discussion about them, how they were broken into courses and how David separated them into their, into their courses and all those things. But we're not going to get into that a whole lot. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I don't want to run off of that, but I've got to ask it. Okay. Did he ever never had any children? Because, I mean, I've seen everything branched off. And I, and I don't see anything that we're ever chosen that had a wife, had any children, had nothing. No. Did, are, does it give any, because uh, like... Um, Susan lived to be 969 years old. Does it tell how long now Chesedith lived? End of days. End of days. No end. No end of days. Okay, so I thought I seen him yesterday. Is that what you're saying? No, no you didn't no. see him yesterday. Okay. I promise you. So that's <laughs> it. <laughs> you said that's end of days. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, so we got the line right there. We got the line. That was Aaron and his sons, the sons of Amram, along with Moses and Miriam. Moses and Miriam were the sons of Amram as well. They were the brother and sister of Aaron. The Levites. Now, of course, Levi has three sons. They all have children, right? And all these are Levites, and it just yeah. keeps on going down. All of them are Levites, but they're not the priests. They're not the priests. The only priest is that line. We talked about that. The first mention of them being of God making them the priest is in Exodus 28. Let's turn there. Exodus 
Let's look at let's look at 27 verse 20. We'll start there first. Exodus 27 verse 20. So God has just commanded uh, Moses about how to all the all the pieces and the parts of the tabernacle and how to put it all together. And so in verse 20 he says, "And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring the pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. So they made pure olive oil to constantly put inside the menorah to, to keep the light burning inside the holy, the holy place. In the tabernacle of the congregation, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, before the testimony is the Ark of the Covenant. This is before the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. So this is the first time it's mentioned that Aaron and his sons are going to do anything in the tabernacle. All right. It shall be a statute forever unto their generation on behalf of the children of Israel. 28 verse 1. And thou and, and take thou unto thee Aaron your brother and his sons with him from the children of Israel that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. That's the first time you hear that Aaron is going to minister in the priest's office of uh, of God, even Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And you shall speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And we're going to get into the garments at another time. But obviously, right here, you see, God has appointed right here Aaron. He's appointed Aaron, right? Now, he's appointed him, and then he anoints him, all right? Once he appoints him, he anoints him. Exodus chapter 29. Verse 4. And Aaron and his sons, you shall bring into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation... Which that's the tabernacle. You're going to bring him unto the door of the tabernacle. And you're going to wash him, wash them with water. And you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe and the ephod, the ephod and the breastplate. Gird him with the, the, the curious girdle of the ephod. And we're going to talk about those things later on. And thou shalt put the mitre on his head and put the crown upon the mitre. Then you shall take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. And you shall bring his sons and put coats on them. And you shall gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them. And the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statue. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. He appoints them, Aaron and his sons, as priests of God. Then he anoints them as priests of God by pouring the oil, oil over their head. Right? Who knows that the Bible, when it's talking about oil, is talking about the Holy Spirit. You might know that. Anytime you see oil, mm -hmm. the pouring on of oil, that's, that is a picture of being covered with the Holy Spirit, being anointed. All right? Remember, everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of the very image to come, the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting too about the Holy Spirit, we talked a little bit about this a couple weeks ago, is that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament... Was upon them. The Holy Spirit was upon them. In the New Testament. After the death of the Lord Jesus. And he sends the Holy Spirit. The, the covenant that he gave in Jeremiah. Was that I will put my spirit in them. You see. Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was on them. New Testament. New covenant. He lives within us. There's a difference. Yes. Uh, do you remember what chapter and verse that was? <laughs> Jeremiah. Yeah. Jeremiah. Um. I had to get it for you. So after he appoints him, he anoints him, and then he confirms it. All right? He confirms it. Uh, 29, verse 44. Verse 44. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. God says... This, I'm going to sanctify him to do this. I'm confirming this. Also, in number 16, if we look at number 16, 
That's the story of Korah. Korah was a Levite in the wilderness. And him and some of the sons of Reuben, they came up and questioned Moses about who are you to be a prince over us? You drug us from Egypt out into this wilderness and the, you took us from a land of milk and honey and you haven't brought us to no milk and honey. You got here out, out here. You're killing us out here. What makes you better than us? God sees all of us as holy. We're all holy unto God. Why are you different? You see? And this proves that God, because Moses says, okay, Korah, you and the 250 men, I'm paraphrasing, by the way, you and the 250 men, you're going to go grab censers, you're going to put fire in them, you're going to come back tomorrow, stand in front of the door of the tabernacle, Aaron's going to do the same thing, and whoever God chooses, you're going to know it. And how did, how did that happen? Well, he created a sinkhole and sucked them all down in and the only one left was standing was Aaron. <laughs> so is that confirmation that Aaron is the priest and not them? That's right. Not the Levites, right? Because they were all Levites. It says that Korah was the son of Kohath. Or his, you know, his grandfather was Kohath, but his dad was Ishar. Which is a, just another line. But you see the line. God makes, he's making sure you're not going to usurp or supersede what I'm saying. I'm telling you that it is Aaron's sons, not or it is Amram's sons, not Ishar's sons. I mean, that's how they were cousins. You see? And God sucked them down in the sinkhole forever. Down to the pit because of that. Because he was gainsayed. The book of Jude says that Korah was a gainsayer. That's what they called him. He was trying to usurp the authority of God. Saying that we're all holy. But God chooses certain people. He chooses certain people. And he confirmed it. He confirmed by killing all the rest of those 250 men and leaving Aaron standing confirms that he is the high priest chosen by God. So now after he confirms him, he instructs him. He instructs him. Turn to Numbers 18. Now we are, this is brief. You can go back and, and, and really read these things. I'm giving you point by point. Go back and read these things and you'll get this, this really big full picture. But I'm just, I'm hitting on the overall here. Numbers 18. Now the Lord speaks directly to Aaron here. He's directly instructing him. He says, in chapter 18, verse 1, we'll read through verse 9. And the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. It's going to be on you. This is your burden to bear all the iniquity of the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. He calls them priesthood again. And your brethren also, the tribe of Levi, he separates them, does he not? The, the tribe of Levi and the priesthood, he separates them. The tribe of your father bring you with you that you may be joined, that they may be joined unto you and minister unto you. But you and your sons with you shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. He makes a distinction. You're going to bring it with you. But it's going to be you and your boys, you and your sons who are going to do this. And they shall keep your charge. And the charge of all the tabernacle. Only they shall not come near the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar. That neither they nor you also die. So God's, that's a threat. Do not allow them to come here or they're going to die and you're going to die as well. I mean, this is pretty distinct. And they shall be joined unto you and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation for all the service of the tabernacle. And a stranger shall not come near unto you. And you shall keep the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the altar, that there be no wrath anymore upon the children of Israel. And I behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To you they are given as a gift for the Lord. To do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Therefore, you and your sons with you shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar. And within the veil. Within the veil is the holy of holies. Within the veil. The other priests can come in here. They cannot go past this. This is only the high priest. Within the veil. Uh, I have given your priest's office unto you as a service of as a service of gift. And the stranger that comes near shall be put to death. So, 
God instructs Aaron that it will be you and your sons. And there is a separation between the Levites and Aaron and the sons. Uh, Aaron and his sons from the Levites. We remember, we, I read a passage, if you were here, this is why it's, it's pertinent that you keep coming to Bible studies because you get a lot of information before that, right? Alfred Edersheim, this man right here, in his book, uh, The Temple and the Ministries During the Time of Jesus Christ, he's explaining what is going on with the priesthood and, and the, the courses and all that stuff. And he says that the Levites were actually priest assistants. You see? They were, they were the ones that were, they were the security guards. They were, you know, they were the cleanup crew. You know, they were doing things like this. Day and night, different courses, different families all, every week was different. And so they weren't priests. They were priest assistants. And all that got messed up when they got, went in captivity in Babylon. They tried to restore it with Ezra and Nehemiah when they came back, but it didn't happen. So, now we said... That this is a hereditary office. Son after son after son after son. Alright? Exodus 27. Turn there right here. We read this verse already. In the tabernacle of the congregation, outside the veil, which is before the testimony or the Ark of the Covenant, Aaron and his sons shall order it from morning to evening before the Lord, and it shall be a statute forever unto their generations. It's going to be for you and your the generations forever. You and your sons. It's a hereditary office. Now, who knows what the Talmud is? Is that the Jewish Bible? Jew All the Jewish... It's Jewish. Go, I'll let you. <laughs> You're right. It's Jewish. <laughs> it's Jewish. Yep. Go ahead. Um, it's. I'd say it's more of a collection of essays written by rabbis over the centuries. Okay. Um, close. That's that's. It's commentary. It's a commentary like Charles Spurgeon writes commentary on the Bible, right? He's writing commentary. He's telling you what it's all about. Just a little background. When they got. Taken to Babylon, the captivity, 586 BC. They're in Babylon. Israel is, all right, or Judah. They're in Babylon. When they're up there, this is when the rabbi is formed, they're created, and the synagogue. This is where it was birthed, all right? When they're up there, they have lost all their the writings and all that stuff. So they're it's word of mouth. Everything is word of mouth. So there, come, there comes about an oral tradition, oral tradition versus the written tradition or the written law. There is an oral law and a written law. And they start saying in Babylon, the, the rabbis start saying there was two laws given at Mount Sinai. One of them was given, given to Moses, written down on the tablets by God. And the other one was given orally to the 70 the 70 uh, elders who were at the base of the mountain. And it was done orally. And that was passed on. This is the oral law. And they separated into two different things. Two different categories. And we've talked about this before. Halakha. Haggadah. You can go look those up. I'm not going to do a whole lot of explaining. But basically these two make up the Talmud. There's two different Talmuds. There's a Jerusalem Talmud. There's a Babylonian Talmud. Right? Most of them, because they believe that Babylon has more authority, the Babylonian Talmud has more authority than the Jerusalem Talmud, they use the Babylonian Talmud. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because there's mention of the priesthood in the Talmud. All right? What they said was, and I'm going to paraphrase, during the first temple era, the first temple era, well, where was the first, who built the first temple? Solomon, right? Solomon built the first temple. During that time, the priesthood was hereditary. Son to son to son to son. He said during the second temple time, who built the second temple? Ezra. No. Who finished the second temple? Ezra, they started it, but who finished it? 
Herod, King Herod, right? He finished it. And then the Lord Jesus, that's the temple that the Lord Jesus was walking around when he was on earth. The temple of Herod, the second temple. All right? So in that temple, the Talmud says that the priesthood was bought with money. It had nothing to do with the hereditary, anything. It was not the sons of Aaron. It was bought with money. Politicians, the Sanhedrin appointed a high priest, a political. It was all political. And you could buy a priesthood office and be a part of the Sanhedrin by political means, by putting enough money in there. You see? So it was completely demolished. Now, you'll hear the Lord Jesus say all the time. He'll say, you've heard it said this, this, and this. But this is what God says. It is written, right? He'll say it is written. You've heard it said, and it is written. You see what, you know why he says that? Because of this. Those Pharisees went by the oral law of Babylon. You see? And this is why, I'm, we're going off on a tangent here, but it's something to talk about. This is why when the Lord Jesus and his disciples were walking through the cornfield, and they were picking ears of corn, the Pharisees says, you can't do that on the Sabbath day. And he said, don't you remember David when he was out and he was running and he went to the priest and gave him bread and all these things? Which one is it? Are you going to do good? Is it better to do good on the Sabbath day or not? When he's in the temple and the man with a withered hand and he comes to him, he's going to heal him, right? And they say, you can't do that. Well, where did they get that from? The oral law. Oral law. Yeah. You see, they said you can't do anything. You, if you can't even breathe, you got to sit in your house, can't even light a candle, nothing. You, can't, you just got to sit and do nothing. And the Lord Jesus says, that's not the way it is. That's not the way the Sabbath is. You see? So, that's where they were getting that from. Yes? I was going to say, there's examples of that today where uh, you'll have certain uh, Jews who won't drive on yep. the Sabbath. Yep. They'll uh, hire a Gentile to drive them to a synagogue. <laughs> right. And uh, I also like, is it the Orthodox Jews who believe in the oral tradition over the written? Or um, they, the rabbinical Jew, the rabbinical Jew, which is I have to get with you on the, the term orthodox. Uh -huh. I don't know if orthodox is different than rabbinical, but your rabbis, all your rabbis and the ones who follow them and they're teaching this sages is what they call them. They believe in the oral law, the oral tradition. All right. They read from the written, but the Talmud is the commentary. On the written. And that's what they use. <laughs> you see? If you go back to the Talmud, there's some interesting things about how... I mean, we can go into this. We're not going to go into that. But So Alfred Edersheim. I want to read something from him right quick. In the book that we were just talking about. That's what he says. He said, the fundamental design of Israel itself was to be unto Jehovah a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Right? We, say, we see that in Peter as well. We're supposed to be, we're, God is making us a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This, however, could only be realized in the fullness of time. It's not going to be realized back in that day. They're not going to be a holy nation of priests because they were sinful. The only time it's going to happen that God's going to make a holy nation of priests is when everything is said and done in the fullness of time. Then all the believers will be kings and priests and that nation will be God's nation. A kingdom of a kings and priests. Uh, at the very outset there was a barrier of sin. Right? Now, even though Israel was sinful and could only approach Jehovah in the way which he himself opened and in the manner which he appointed direct choice and appointment by God were the conditions alike of the priesthood of the sacrifices of the feast and of every detail of service. It was only God who made the choice and the appointment. It was not people themselves. Korah. You see, it was not people. It was God who did these things. The fundamental ideas which underlay all and connected it all into a harmonious whole were reconciliation, mediation. The whole reason for the priesthood was for mediation, to mediate on behalf of the people, 
and stand for the people to reconcile them to God. That was the whole reason. The one expressed by typically atoning sacrifices, the covering sacrifices, and the other typically intervening priesthood. Right? So he gives you the reason why the priesthood was created. God created it to mediate for the people. One person to come unto God for the people. All right? Now the Jews still, I, I was going to look up the date. If anybody can look up the date of Yom Kippur, it's in October. I don't know if they've had it already, but it's in October. They have it every year. The Day of Atonement. The high priest goes into the temple. They reenact these things. They don't have a temple, do they? In, in Jerusalem? Now? They don't have one. It's not there. They're trying to rebuild it, actually. So they reenact these things. But the Day of Atonement is exactly what that's talking about. The priest, one time a year, Aaron, would go into the Holy of Holies, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, which the mercy seat is a picture of the Lord Jesus. That's a picture of him as a covering of, the, of our sin. And when he would do that, he would take two goats, two sacrifices. He would slay one of the goats, bring that blood, sprinkle on the mercy seat, and then he would touch, put his hand on the other goat and send it out into the wilderness. Now, what's interesting about that, this is one of his duties. What's interesting about that is, once he touched the goat and sent it off into the wilderness, if it came back, that was a sign that God didn't forgive their sin. But if it stayed out there, then it was a, it was a sign that he did forgive their sin. That's pretty interesting, yes? Wasn't the day of atonement every Saturday at New Moon? It was once a year, every year. On a Saturday at New Moon? I knew when. Uh, on a Sabbath day? Those were Sabbath uh, days. Leviticus, I think it's in yeah. Leviticus uh -huh. chapter 16, but I think it's on a Saturday. I'll have to look, I'll have think, to look that up. I think it's on a Saturday and a new moon. Yeah. Well, Saturday is on a Sabbath day. Yeah. I believe new moons are also Sabbath days. Day of Atonement. Is Yom Kippur the Day of Atonement? Yes. Okay, it was on Friday, September the 29th. Okay. September the 29th, okay. Was that? The 29th of September. Through the 30th of the next, yep. yeah, right. Yep. Okay. So, when was it every year? Okay. Like what day, you're asking? What day was it? Is that what you're saying? No, I, no, no, I just said Saturday, and the new moon is when the day of the dome, when they used to do it. Okay. Yeah. Which starts uh, Friday at sundown and goes through. Saturday. Right, which is their day. Right. It's not it's not like ours, right? right. They right. evening and in the morning. Right. So all right, let's continue. So we've got through Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, kind of overview of how God has selected Aaron, confirmed him, anointed him by Moses. All this was done by Moses, who was called the mediator between God and man. So Moses is the one who's getting the instructions and he's doing these things to Aaron. And so Aaron and his sons are confirmed. They are the Levitical priesthood that you'll see continuing all the way up until Babylon. Right? All the way up until Babylon. And then when they come back from Babylon, it kind of gets jumbled up. And the courses get messed up and they start just pulling priest assistant families and making them the old names. And then when the second temple comes around, this is when we got, it's all messed up. Priests are buying, buying in for money. I, I want to be a priest. Mm -hmm. knowing, knowing nothing, you know. And so, um, so we got all that. Now, I would go back up here. And we, we're going to talk about the functions of the priest. All right. What is his job? What's his duty? We've seen how God has made this particular line. And how he's brought this family um, of Aaronites in the priesthood. But what is their job? What are they supposed to do? All right? Let's, let's turn back to Hebrews. Now you can read through you can read through Leviticus and it'll tell you all the ceremonial things and the ritual things and the washings and the sacrifices and all this, right? But what is the purpose? Right? What's that? The priest. The priest. He's supposed to be like the civil head of the people. Okay, that's right. So Hebrews, turn to Hebrews 2.
Verse 17. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to, to be made like unto his brethren. Let's talk about the Lord Jesus becoming like a human being, us. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Here's what he did. Here's what one job of the priest. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. That's one, one of his functions. This is what he does on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He goes in to make reconciliation between him. He is the mediator between him and God and the people. All right? Just like the Lord Jesus is called the high priest. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, the high priest, who goes and he makes intercession for us. That is what Aaron was doing every year when he would go into the most holy place. All right? He was making reconciliation for the sins of the people. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to give you this concept in the Old Testament. In Leviticus 9, it says this. And Moses said unto Aaron, Go unto the altar, and offer thy, thy sin offering, and thy burnt offering, and make an atonement for yourself and for the people, and offer the offering of the people, and make an atonement for them. As the Lord commanded. That's what he was doing. Making like reconciliation between God and them. Hebrews 5. Turn to Hebrews 5. Verse 1. For every high priest. Taken from among men. Is ordained for men. In things pertaining, pertaining to God. That he may, what's the second job? That he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. That's his second job. So as we've seen in Leviticus right there, that Moses says you're going to bring your sin offering, bring your burnt offering for yourself and for the people. So that's his second job. Hebrews 9. Starting at verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. What's the first tabernacle? Right here. Yeah. Right here. The holy place. Yeah. The priest went in and did the services, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then look at verse 7. But in the second went the high priest alone. Once every year. See? He goes into the Holy Club, Holy of Holies once a year mm -hmm. in there. Yes. When uh, I talk, was talking to you about the second priest, what does he do? Is he allowed to go in where the first priest goes or no? What do you mean first priest and second priest? Well, Jeremiah 52, 24 talks about the second priest. But I want to know what he does. Let's turn there. Jeremiah what? 52, 24. Jeremiah 52, 24. Okay, the captain of the guard took Sariah the chief priest and Zephaniah the second priest and the three keepers of the door. Now I do know, I do know that um, that they were that there were direct assistants for the high priest. They used to go in there with them, but there was only only the high priest could go behind the veil. So I don't know if I'll look that up. Who's the second priest in Jeremiah? I'll have these answers for you next week. It's a good question. See, there's a lot of things that we don't catch, right? It takes other people. Everybody needs to study so we can come in here and discuss this because I don't that's an interesting Maybe he was point. the doorkeeper. It says the three doorkeepers. So I don't know if he was separate or I'll find out. So verse 7. Let's go back to that. 
but into the second with the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. What was another job of his? To go into the whole, most holy place once a year, make reconciliation unto God for the people. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't specifically say it here, but turn to Numbers 35 right quick. Numbers 35. Now what this is talking about is the, the city of refuge. We studied that, any the city of refuge. If a man killed somebody by accident, he was able to go into the city where the high priest was. Look at verse 25. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood. So the person chasing it down, right? He gets, he gets sanctuary. It's like a sanctuary. And the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, where whether he was fled, wherever he fled. And he shall abide in it until the death of the high priest. You see? So... The priest had a particular place in the law for the manslayer as a head and a representative of uh, things pertaining to life and death. You see, he had this, he had a specific duty, just like she said, he was a civil leader as well that pertained to things pertaining to life and death. So if a man came, he could stay there until the death of the priest. Now, we can study that, but we're not going to go into that, but that's one of the functions that he does as well. And we're going to continue on. There's many functions. As we start studying the Lord Jesus and the symbology behind the clothing and behind the temple and all the things that go into that, you're going to see, get a really good full picture of who the Lord Jesus is, what he did, how he did it, why is it important to us. So I want to point out this right quick. I didn't point this out a while ago. If you go to Numbers... This is how the tabernacle is laid out every time they go in the wilderness, every time they're marching, right? They all have their, their banners, right? They all have their banners. And under these banners is where they will be. And God specifically lays out how they will be every time they set up camp. They're going to set up the tabernacle. The Levites are going to set it up. And then this is how they will be, the tribes, just like this, all right? I got the, the directions here as well. East, north, west, south. Now, he specifically says that the sons of Levi were going to be close to the tabernacle, closer than the other tribes. And this is how they are. Kohath, Gershon, the families of Gershon, the families of Merari. And then you have two people who are on the east side, Moses and Aaron. Those are the only two out of the Levites. Those two people were the only ones on the east side. This whole family was on this side. This whole family was on this side. It was these two. Now what's interesting about that, too, is we talked about this way back. Judah is on the east side, too. Who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? The Lord Jesus. If you look at Jerusalem as the town is like this, here's the, the temple facing east, right? The Lord Jesus is coming back on the Mount of Olives, right? Yes. Is on the east. The line of the tribe of Judah is coming in through the east. You see? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. North, south, east, and west. I think that's First Chronicles where it tells all of that. Starting First Chronicles where it's telling them about where they're at. Yeah, well, Numbers does too. Numbers points it out. It tells you all the numbers and where they're, where they're laid out. But this is how it looked. And imagine now, you have thousands of people, and they have tents. And if you were to say... Go up in a plane. They had planes back then. You were to look down on them. You'd have this tabernacle and just tents everywhere. Just spread out. See, we really don't get a picture of it when we look at pictures. But if you go to Jerusalem, uh, during the three times that they're supposed to go every year, God commanded that all the males would come from all over the world and come three times a year into Jerusalem. They're still doing that. They are just millions of tents all over the place. All over the place. And if you... Uh, me and my wife and a couple other people, but yeah, we're talking about taking a trip to, Jer to Jerusalem. All right. I want to go. The reason I want to go is because it's going to open this up big time. Right. It's going to 
Me too. <laughs> we all need to go. We all need to go. That's one of my life dreams. Is, uh, yeah. You know, I'm going. Lord willing, I'm going because I want to see the Bible in real life. So, but the Mount of Olives, if you go, it's a graveyard. I don't know if y'all know that or not. It's full. The whole thing is just graves. It's boxes. The stone boxes that they put the bones in. Just the whole Mount of Olives is covered. It's covered with those graves. But I just wanted to show you that. So we're going to continue on next week uh, with the vestments. I want to get into the vestments, which is the, the clothing. Okay. All right, Tim was talking about the clothing. We're going to get into that. Every piece of his clothing is symbolic. It's symbolic. And so we'll study all that. Are there any questions over what we have went over tonight? The only thing it makes me see is where it says in Matthew 7, 14, straight is the gate and narrow the way up into life. If you buy there, find it. And when you have that in Proverbs uh, 30, verse 5, mm -hmm. every word of God is pure. Yep. He's a shield for those who put their trust in him. I'm telling you, I mean, as old as I am, I haven't heard anything like this. And people just don't preach this. And, they don't, and, and I tell you right now, they just don't, people don't know it. I know they don't. It's, of all the things that I've heard, and, and right now, I mean, it, it, it opens up a, a field that I, it's something I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the point. Yeah. That's why we're here, is to learn yeah. this. You know, I'll be reading all of this. I read all of this. Yep. But honestly, hearing it. That's right. Yes. Hearing yep. it just brings it to life with sure. sweat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Agree. Yeah. And yeah. it's yeah. so much it better does. hearing it after you read it, read it, read it. Agree. I mean, and it just brings it all out. It's, yeah. you know, I, the thing that helps, the thing that I like about this, I, well, we got a small group, but the thing I like about this, and the, we got an assignment this week, by the way, we got an assignment. We see all this stuff, but people are pointing out things that I've never seen, and they're saying, can you look this up? Can you do that? And they're throwing their own two cents, right? Not two cents, but what the Word of God says, and it brings just a bigger picture for all of us. That's right. Yeah, I'm only tying things together. Because these, the numbers of the Genesis and Deuteronomy and Leviticus is hard to, it's hard to eat, ain't it? It is. It's like really hard to eat. But I think once you lay a foundation, you got to take it slow. Just take it slow and start putting things together, putting things together. It takes time. So, and it does help right here. It helps me. I'm listening, listening to it too. <laughs> so, it's, um, it's making better sense for me too. Any questions? Here's your assignment. Read it. This week, the book of Hebrews. Read it and read it and read it and read it. Just continue to read it because as we're doing this study, that's the book I want you to read. Continue to read. Just, just keep on going over it. The tie, the major tie between the New Testament and the Old Testament is Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. To understand the Old Testament Read the book of Hebrews, and here's what's going to happen. What's going to happen is, is as we finish this study, you've read the book of Hebrews how many ever times, right? And now you're seeing what's going on in the Old Testament. Now we go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see their accounts, and you start seeing the Lord Jesus walk, and you start seeing how he's the priest and how what he did when he died and when he took, you know, and all things, start, all the gospels are going to tie into this. And everything Paul was talking about to the churches of who the Lord Jesus was is going to tie into this. See how it all ties in together. So read this book. Continue to read it. I'm going to bring something that we, me and Jonathan was talking about it a little bit. I'm going to show you next week how many quotes are in the, old, in the book of Hebrews that are from the Old Testament. It is a large, large amount. And what I started doing was I started taking those. I got, a, I got a Bible that italicizes the Old Testament quote. So I started writing the Old Testament quote and then going back to the Old Testament and then writing the New Testament Hebrews so-and-so. And so as I go back to read the Old Testament, I can see how many times in the New Testament it's mentioned in the Old Testament. Yeah. You see? So I want to bring that to your attention next week. Okay, you got to answer this question for me. I mean, I... And found her on this one. I asked about Melchizedek, death, and you said he's alive until the end of times. I mean, am, am I am I talking uh, spiritual, or, or what are we talking when 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 I ask you how old he was? 
when he died. Yep. There's no there's no given time nope. for it. So in the end of times, are we talking when this world is no more and heaven opens up and we all enter into the kingdom of heaven? Is that what you think? I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll read it again what it says. And this is the only thing I can, I mean, I can't explain it any further because it's a mystery. I mean, Melchizedek right. is a mystery man. I know it is. You know, he's a mystery man. He is, but what it says is, he is the, he is the, uh, his name means king of righteousness. And he is the king of Salem, which is, Salem means peace. So he's the king of peace. He is without father. He is without mother. He is without descent. He has no family lineage whatsoever. Having neither beginning of days nor ending of days, he is eternal. Melchizedek is an eternal being. So maybe he lives through us. All right. Okay. But, but so, or nor end of life, but made like unto the son of God, he abides as a priest continually. Jesus is anointed on this earth as a priest of Melchizedek. All right. After his death. Right. But this man was made after the Lord Jesus. Do you understand that? The Lord Jesus is eternal. This man was put on this earth as a picture of the Lord Jesus. All right. However, God made him eternal or not without end of days. I don't know. I don't know what he is. He's, but he is a man who was on this earth who Abraham talked to. And he was a man who God put on this earth. And this says that he had no descent. That means he God probably just dropped him on the earth just, just like that. No, he had no family lineage. He wasn't born. God brought him from heaven and dropped him straight on the earth. That's, what, that's the way I look at it. That's the way I see it. This is why a lot of pastors, when I say this hasn't been taught, because I've asked a few pastors. And they, they didn't come up with any of this. And they were like, yeah, that Mel comes up. He, he kind of like he was the Lord, maybe, or maybe he maybe took part of Christ. You know what I mean? And they didn't, they couldn't give me even a close of, of where you're at here. Some people believe that he was, uh, he was the Lord Jesus, right. but it obviously says right here that he was made like unto. He was right. not him. Yes. Um, uh, a lot of, uh, I'll just uh, give another example of uh, what people, a lot of people would consider to be an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. Uh, would be in the book of Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego yeah, yeah. Uh, when uh, he's thrown in. And I'll just read uh, the verse. It's uh, chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. I'll just read them real quick. Okay. Uh, then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astounded and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So it could have been no <laughs> So, so yeah, no, like that's uh, right. a lot of One like of reasons why people would believe know. like Melchizedek would be yeah. an incarnation right. of Jesus, yes. or uh, this man in the fire would be an yep. incarnation of yep. Jesus, or uh, there's another one in uh, the Book of Joshua. Okay. And there's they're actually just all over the Old Testament. Yeah. What we need, what we need to understand is this: is that Melchizedek, he is called the priest of the Most High God. That's what he's called. Yeah. What at what manner of man this is, I don't. It's not important. What what manner of order of priesthood he is is what's important. That's what's important. How he got here, how he lived. Obviously, he didn't have end of life. It says he didn't have end of life. Yeah. So obviously, he would just take it. You know, like like Elijah was just taken, right? Yeah. Enoch. He was just gone. He was just taken. Yeah. So it doesn't say, all it says is no end of life. So he was, I mean, Melchizedek may still be here. I don't know. I'm, I don't know. Yeah. But he's, he has no end of life. He's eternal. Yes. It said the same thing about Aaron. What's that? Aaron, high priest, is a type of Christ. He is. Yeah. He's a type. A type, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. But the only difference is, is that. I, I, what I see is that Melchizedek was made, he was made like unto Christ. Yeah. He was made like him. You know, he, so he, he looked like him on earth. You know what I mean? Like, that's the way I look at it. Aaron was a sinner. You know, it doesn't say anything about Melchizedek. I don't know. But, 
we can go on and on about Melchizedek, right? I mean, we said that at the beginning. I mean, just never ending because he's a mystery. Yeah. Take your glass darkly. Yeah, he's, he's a mystery. We will one day know. That's right. Probably. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, let's pray. Our Father, how wonderful it is to be able to open your word and see the the um, the things that come out of, out of your word. I mean, it's unspeakable, and I get so excited every week when I'm able to come up here and, and speak on the things of your word and to be able to study because it's endless. I mean, nothing can be exhausted, and I appreciate that, Lord. Um, I thank you for allowing us to study. I, I pray that you give us a further desire, a deep desire to want to study your word and understand who you are and why you've done the things you've done for us. Um, King David said, who is man that you are mindful of us? We are nothing. We are dust and ashes before you. The fact that we can even think, the fact that we can understand and have knowledge on your word is, is a testament to you and your grace and your mercy and your blessing upon us. Um, I pray that as we leave here, that you would allow us to ponder and meditate on the priesthood. Give us a spiritual understanding of the priesthood. We are digging, in, digging into how you anointed Aaron and how you um, allowed his sons to be the priest and you gave them instruction. But all these things we know, according to your word, are pointing to the spiritual priesthood, pointing to the Lord Jesus as our high priest. I pray that you help us understand these things. I want to know who you are more and more every day, and I pray that you would give everybody a desire here as well to, know, to want to know you, not just read your word to, uh, um, to say that I, I read the Bible. And not to try to impress anybody, but to actually want to read it to get to know you. Amen. That's the whole purpose. Instruct us, Lord. Teach us. Um, and I pray that you get the glory and the honor for all these things. And I pray as well that if it be your will, that more people would come out and learn these things. Um, you are gracious and merciful. And I appreciate you. Lord, for allowing us to do this. I pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.